All right. We're almost at the finish line. Thank you all for being here. It's been fabulous. And I couldn't be more thrilled than to have the opportunity to talk to two men whom I admire deeply. Um, they're, Saul Khan and Common are really remarkable. So here, as I sort of started studying this conversation, I thought, well, you guys never met each other before ASU GSV. Um, you two actually, in my view, have a lot more in common than you might have thought. So one, you're both rock stars in your own right. <laughs> yeah. I told Saul, I bet half the audience is here for the Common the rock star and half is for Saul the rock star. So we are a unique audience in that way. You're both optimists, based on my experience with both of you. I kind of learned you're both tech geeks. I knew you were, but now I know you are. Um, you're both uplifters. You lift people up consistently, and you're both teachers. So why don't we actually start with that question first and have you tell your story about the role and importance of teachers and mentors, um, especially for our most vulnerable students. Uh, you use a Brian Stevenson quote common in one of your proximity is one of the most impactful things that we can do. So why don't we start, start with you, Sal, and hear how you, your perspective on. Yeah, you know, this is one of those things where uh, as Khan Academy got out there and people started saying, hey, there's this virtual thing that could teach people, I think a lot of people started saying, maybe this is like what Amazon did to Barnes and Nobles, uh, that this is virtual versus physical schools. Uh, and for me, it's always been the opposite. It's always been, what could uh, technology or virtual tools do to liberate what happens in a physical classroom? And it's never been technology for technology's sake, but it's really with a, with a purpose. Uh, and so when you, when you talk to educators, uh, they're, they're, they're heroically trying to reach every student where they can and, and individualize. Differentiation has always been a best practice for them. Uh, but it's just always been hard for them to do. So a lot of what we're trying to focus on is, you know, working with as many teachers as possible on how do we help them reach, uh, you know, the, the needs of, of individual students. And I got to tell you, you know, just, just in, in, in my own personal journey, um, you know, you start in, in second grade, uh, uh, Miss Roussel, uh, there was this kind of this enrichment class that I started taking out. That was the first time that an adult actually, of, of any, you know, teacher, family member, anything. I, and I still remember the day, you know, she said, I said, what am I supposed to do here? She's like, well, what are you interested in? Yeah. And, and that kind of blew my mind. Uh, and, and, it was, and she kind of treated me as, as a bit of an equal, but a mentor. And the fact that I was seven years old, and I still remember that day, True. it might be the only day I remember from uh, 1982, 83. <laughs> 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 um, uh, tells you something, and then if you add, you know, Miss Ellis, I remember in fifth grade, who used to kind of run her fifth grade social studies class, like a history seminar at a college. But those moments, the fact that I can remember them in front of, you know, right now, tells you how, how much of an impact uh, those, those human beings in your life can, can have. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, um, for me as a writer um, and as an artist, I always felt it was important to go into environments and learn. And a lot of my music had come from my experiences and going to different communities. Um, and I would absorb and then give out new thoughts and sometimes also remind people of what was going on. I actually think teaching has, at its best, can can have that aspect to it where you really like um, immerse yourself in to the people that you want to that you want to learn um, the people and the environments that you want to teach it's an interactive thing I think some of the um, greatest qualities of any teachers that I've had they're, they're great listeners and they are eager to learn themselves and I think um, you know for me I uh, look at teachers as the some of the most valuable human beings on the planet, and they are. And I mean, obviously, which I've told many times, my mom is a former teacher and principal, so I kind of learned it organically, but throughout my process, I saw, I didn't realize I was even in music teaching until I became interactive with more people. And um, they, they told me the things that they learned, but then I was eager to learn from them. So, I mean, I'm saying that to say, I think, you know, um, one of the greatest things that we could do as teachers 
if I would consider myself a teacher, <laughs> um, is to listen and, and to learn and um, figure out creative and strategic ways to, to affect those who, who are your students. Good. The, this is obviously an education innovation conference and human capital innovation conference. Um, you two each have real passions um, around education and its ability to change lives and, and its ability to combat ignorance, frankly, at the end of the day. Um, can you, obviously, you, you, as you said, grew up with that organically with your wonderful mother, Anne, here in the audience. Um, comment on that story, though, your, your journey to become focused on education as the key lever, and thoughts you have on how we, we, we clearly still are not reaching enough kids with a quality education. And thoughts you have, and Saul, I know you've actually got some programs happening off Khan Academy. How do we reach more vulnerable kids yeah. um, to, make, to bring everyone up to the same level and have equal access to the future, which is the way we yeah. phrased it? Well, I, th I think similar to something, referring back to something Saul said earlier, is like he remembers that moment in 82 as a seven-year-old when somebody spoke, um, you know, his teacher, said some significant things to him. I think um, it's like if we understand the value of what teachers do, I mean, I remember my, one of my most impactful teachers named Mr. Brown, who was my math teacher, but he was a brilliant math teacher. I still think I know the radius, the formula for the radius of a circle, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Don't test me, but I would, I would but. That being said, he, he kind of looked like Luther Vandross, and he was this great teacher. <laughs> and, uh, but he, his way of teaching was really impactful. Where I remember it, like the methods he did was beautiful, but also how much he showed he cared, how much he disciplined us you know, in, in, in ways where we had to learn these formulas. And, and I bring that up just to say like the, the heart and, and, and the passion that we see in teachers makes it made me feel value as valued as a young black man it was a male figure who was really like hey you guys can go out there and do things he taught more than just math in his class by example and i think what we obviously recognize is like the value we give to those uh, those communities that are underserved i felt empowered like one of the greatest things i had as a young man was that i felt smart and that was you know um you get those things just from like training and, and getting the tools. Because, because parallel to that, I was playing basketball and initially I wasn't good because I hadn't practiced as much. But because I knew I prepared myself in education, I always felt like empowered in that way. And even when I went out in other communities, I mean, other parts of my community, and it was dudes that had other attributes, I still felt empowered that I had education and I was smart. And I think that's something that we can, we don't, we don't realize how well young men and women would feel with just getting that empowerment that they are educated in a way that they like feel like, man, I'm intelligent and I can accomplish these things. And, and whether it's in a certain field or, you know, a specific like lane that they want to get education in, just having that is empowering, you know. Perfect segue, Khan Academy, an empowerment. Yeah, I mean, to, to your point, you know, these days there's a lot of conversation about uh, where we're going with technology and automation and AI and self-driving trucks and you know cashierless stores, and 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 it's interesting because the more I hear about these conversations or I hear them, they're they're not really talking about education anywhere near as much as you know. There's a lot of people who say, oh well, we shouldn't worry too much about these four million truck drivers or four million people who work in retail because look at the industrial revolution; it kind of just worked out. Uh, yes, some people lost jobs, the weavers and the horses, uh, but, <laughs> but um, at least most humans on that net did, did, did okay. But what I, what I point out is it, it didn't happen just on its own, that the Industrial Revolution simul was, was simultaneous with probably one of the biggest bets we ever made, which was free mass public education. education. Uh, that most of the world two, three hundred years ago, oh, yeah, two, two, three, two, two, most of the world two, three hundred years ago was 20, 30 percent literate. So you can imagine where we'd be now if we had the Industrial Revolution, but we did not have uh, near 100% literacy. You wouldn't have a middle class, you wouldn't have the economy that you had. And, and so when we think about where we're going now, 
uh, with artificial intelligence and robotics that's going to go way deeper into what human beings are capable of, uh, we're going to need a similar bet on human capability. Uh, you know, some of these conversations about you know, what, universal basic income and whatever, that maybe is part of it to, to soften the, the blow of some of the disruption. Uh, but the only way we're going to have, uh, you know, I, 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 I watch a lot of science fiction. And so yeah. I, if you look at Star Trek. Star Trek, I know, the, you like Star Trek. <laughs> my, from, from an economics <laughs> point of view, um, you'll see there's, you know, there, people aren't, they don't have to work for their needs anymore. And technology is promising that, that we won't have to work to survive but we should have work to, to have purpose. Well, talk more about Khan Academy and how you are making bigger moves into school districts now as we think about how to bring kids up who are not, who are not prepared to address these challenges. Yeah, so, so that's our, you know, our, our hope, is that Big Bet was made in the 18th, 19th centuries on universal mass public education. But there were some, some things that, that had to be done in order to make that mass. You had to have every student learn at the same pace. If, some students didn't get certain concepts. They kind of got left behind, but that was okay in the Industrial Revolution. You know, these kids would become the doctors, lawyers, teachers, engineers. These kids would be kind of the mid-level managers, and these kids could go work in the factory. But now that you have the robots and you, you have your artificial intelligence, the, the labor pyramid is going to be completely different. And so you're either going to have a very small top of the pyramid that's accruing all the wealth, and then you just have to do massive redistribution, to keep a stable society, or we're going to have to figure out how to get most people to participate at the top, most people to have real knowledge skills, most people to be an entrepreneur. And the, there, there's many dimensions to it, but in our mind, one important dimension is the ability to truly differentiate to the needs of the individual student so that they don't hit a wall in algebra class because they had a gap in dividing decimals, or they don't hit a wall in their first you know, chemistry class because uh, some of the basic biology wasn't there. Uh, so what we're doing is, you know, folks are familiar with us. We have a, a lot of folks use us, about 17 million come every month and do some type of an action on Khan Academy. But we have, uh, we have about approaching 2 million students, mainly in the U.S., who are using us at a level that we're seeing some pretty good efficacy results, where if you use us even 30 minutes or more a week, we're seeing 20, 30 percent greater than expected growth. And so our, our central question is, you know, 20, 30 percent can add up to a lot over, over uh, 12 years. So our central question is, how do we go, you know, we have a lot of kids using us, a big chunk of American kids, but how do we get all 57 million kids to use us at the level where we're seeing uh, the, the bar moving? Because it really is a kind of a slow motion national emergency. If you look at community colleges, 70% of kids at community college have to take remedial math. Mm -hmm. And remedial math is a euphemism for sixth grade math. Right. So you really have, you know, six years of those kids, I, I think, are um, kind of going through the motions. And then we all know when you have to take remedial math, you're in a situation where you're not going to get a, a credit, not credit gr right. granting course, and then you're likely to not graduate but still have debt and probably be a little angry. Uh, so, yeah, that's our central question. How can we partner with districts? And a lot of what we're trying to do, districts are telling us they want better support, teacher training, um, integration with their rostering systems, things like that. That's stuff we always shied away from, uh, being, and we're still a fairly small, nonprofit organization. Uh, but we realize if we really want to get the 57 million kids, uh, we've got to start doing that, and we're, we're exploring that, and, and we're open to any districts out there. Out there, I yeah, yeah. You, could, you could hear a little, yeah. little feedback there. Um, keying off a little bit of what, what Saul said, common. I um, I actually can't hear the term AI without hearing your voice in my ear. AI, oh, <laughs> AI, <laughs> <You do> AI. <laughs> I love it. It's brilliant. And Saul, so you've actually been quoted as saying technology is making us rethink the nature of human purpose, potential, and opportunity. That's actually been a pretty big theme of our summit. It's actually bending the arc of human potential is kind of what we've all been talking about here in our various rooms. I'd love to hear kind of from each of you what you think about tech in the future, because I think there is, I mean, you were telling sort of the, neg the, the, the negative case, the pessimistic case. I think there's also, you know, a, a real optimistic case, particularly as it relates to learning and everything else. But I'm just curious what, what you guys think. Well, I mean, I feel like that I'm very, um, I'm a good person to ask that question because honestly, like my relationship with technology had to grow like into something that I felt confident and felt the optimism in it. 
uh, my, my initial c- connection with a lot of this b- interaction on a, on in social media and technology was like, because I'm, I'm a real connecting, per- I like to connect with people, like I'm a people person. So I was initially like, man, this is too much. We're going to, you know, we're going to lose our emotional connections and like the things that we get as human beings. But, you know, I had to grow or just be like an older guy and be stuck using <laughs> flip phones and those things that you see guys doing. But I, I couldn't do that anymore. I had to move forward. And then within moving forward, I started realizing like how technology could be used for positive things. And I mean, obviously, you know, with my relationship with Microsoft, I learned so much about how they're using AI for, for positive things. But I also always think about the community that I come from and think about if we could just get those young women and men involved and from an early age. I mean, because we have all these incredible kids that have so much talent and so much flair. Now, if they're given the tools that, you know, when it comes to technology at, such, at a young age, I mean, how much forward would we be? How, how much greater would the world be? And, and also with the right intentions, I still think we, use, we have to use technology with a balance in a way that I'm, I'm as much for education when it comes to technology and academic things as well as emotional education and, and, and like, like really, I don't know if I have a, a term for it, but it's like healing education and, and therapy education and all, the, all those things. So when I put technology in that conversation, I also recognize the balance of those things, but I also, in the future, if, if we can get the technology to the hood the way it should be, I really feel technology would be used in the greatest ways. We would see it be used in ways we never thought of, so. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, I mean, as you introduced both of us, you know, I, I'm very optimistic about aspects of technology. Uh, we're going to have medical science cure things that right now seem un- incurable. Uh, we're going to have, you know, I think there's a SpaceX launch in a little bit. I mean, you know, things like that. You're, you're going to have AI do things that are going to take away a lot of mundane human tasks that, frankly, were, were dehumanizing for the people who had to do them before. Uh, but I, 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 I do worry about two things. I mean, I, I, about the, you know, even, if, even if technology were static, there, there are too many people who are marginalized. Yep. And so how do they participate? And then when you have this rapid change happening, uh, how, 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 do, how do we make sure that everyone can keep up with that change? But the, the place where I'm optimistic, obviously, is I think technology can play a role in helping that teacher make the classroom, ironically, maybe even more humanizing, to have more interactivity between the human beings, allow the teacher to have information and know what intervention can I do with those group of kids right there, or maybe I could pair those two students up yeah. so that they can help each other and build their empathy and their communication skills. So I think there's a lot of powerful things there. Um, I think, you know, we're, we're kind of going through this first wave of social networking and all of that, and we're, we're seeing both the good and the bad. We're connecting with people from 10 years ago, 20 years ago, but we're also seeing how it can take you down these rabbit holes that yeah. can take you to extremes. Um, I, 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 I've got to believe that there's an opportunity, and this isn't something we're working on, I hope someone out here is, is if there's ways to, to, for technology to facilitate deeper human interactions in yep. person, uh, I, you know, even in my own friend circle, I sense, you know, a lot of people, they're doing well in their life, they're, they're able to pay their mortgages and go on vacations, but they, they do feel, I think, a, a little bit of, of an emptiness. They don't feel that same community that they did. Uh, you know, when I talk to my family and, you know, from the Indian subcontinent, you know, everyone would get in everyone's business, and that's not cool, but, they, <laughs> but, but, there, was, but there was something nice about that, of, of people just showing up and, yep. and, and really feeling like a family, and you know if you had an emergency, there's going to be 10 people who are going to be helping you on your doorstep, and it feels like... Um, some of that's been getting lost. You know, some of this might have happened through churches and communities and, 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 and a lot of places, especially as we start you know, moving around the country, a lot of it gets lost. So I think there's a huge opportunity for technology to serve uh, either people to form real deep human connections, friendships, uh, and, and, and communities. Another thing I found that you two really share is a passion about citizenship um, and really encouraging young people to become active citizens. 
uh, and part really participate in our democracy, in particular here in the U.S. Well, why don't you talk about that for a minute, because I couldn't agree more. Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> you know, growing up on the south side of Chicago, as a black kid, I, I really didn't think about, like, <laughs> Chicago. Of course, we got some Chicagoans in here. We're going you know, to make some noise, right? <laughs> but uh, I really didn't think about, like, citizenship and think about myself as American so much, to be honest. Um, it was just, I, I was really trying to learn more about myself just in an organic way and just learn about, I learned about being a young black man just naturally from all the positives and some of the ills that existed. But um, I think as I, you know, matured and, and got exposed to more things and then, to be honest, I probably em embraced my citizenship most when President Obama was first running or just in that mode. That, that really kind of made me... It was a... You know, it, it takes time for you to see yourself as a hero until you see somebody like yourself as a hero. Yeah. <laughs> so it just took time for me to be like, oh, I'm an American citizen, actually. Yes, America. Um, but I really feel that now, and I feel the oneness in us all. And I think, you know, that citizen, which citizenship comes humanity, comes compassion, and comes the most important thing that I feel like is how do we employ love more and more. And that is something that I feel comes with being a citizen in a way that for a long time I've been doing things for, for the community to build up black people. But one time I was sitting talking with a, a young black man. He said, well, what are you doing for women? And I said, man, that's a great question because it's easy for me to do for myself. I'm a black person. But what am I doing for people that don't look like me or that may be a different gender, you know, like, what am I doing? And, and I think that's what citizenship entails when you don't move Great. only in thinking about um, who, who you are in your community. Obviously, the law of, un of the universe, you, go, you gotta love self and take care of self and you take care of family, but you also, within consideration with those things in community, you, you think about this person over here and you think about what those decisions and everything is not made from um, how can I benefit um, type of action. And I think within citizenship, I, I'm going to get more into asking the question myself, this question, what am I doing to be a good citizen every day? Like, what am I like the same way I want to ask myself, what am I doing to give myself love every day? What am I doing to be a good citizen to the people that I don't think about all the time. So I think that's, you know, for me, what our responsibility is as citizens and going back to Brian Stevenson to take that time to go outside of our proximity, to go into someone else's proximity, and then that would give us a better understanding of the citizens that do exist in this world, because we do just walk past each other or get on the elevator and don't even think about the next person. Right. Wonderful. Yeah. 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 No, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think that it goes into this notion of, I think that's what we all crave. Yeah. You know, after we can pay our bills, we want to have that community and that... that oh, and you're really pushing a civics curriculum. And, and, too. and, yeah, and yeah, and then if you go, you know, to a larger and larger level, at some point, you need to learn to participate. And, and you know, it's very easy, especially in the U.S., to get kind of cynical about things on both sides. People are going to say how everything's broken and nothing's happening. But, you know, when I went through the process, I'm not a historian by training, and it wasn't just me, but, you know, I got to talk to some of the top constitutional scholars in the, in the, in the country and, and, and top professors and, and, go and, and kind of learn uh, civics through their lens. Um, it, one, made me incredibly patriotic, uh, and it also made me appreciate how messy a good process should be. Right. Uh, and if anything, where we are now, even though it's easy to get very cynical about it, if you look at the past, you know, I, I mean, one of the best things that, that Hamlet came out as, a, as you know, on Broadway, because people see, even back then, how dirty <laughs> and, uh, um, politics was. But you see, even in, the, in, the, in you know, if you look at the five time, ten year time horizon, it looks messy and it looks like nothing's happening. But if you look over 10, 20, 30, 50, 100, 200 years, you do see this steady uh, march forward. And the only reason why it'll stop is if people become cynical or 
if they become misinformed or they're, or, they're, or they're not allowed to get informed. And so that's why the civics education is a, is a big deal for us. Obviously, you know, we're doing American government and, and, and politics, uh, but um, we want a lot of those ideas to, to spread as, as broadly as, as possible. You know, I mean, you know, my, some of my pessimistic talk about um, AI and, and automation, a lot of people are afraid of China and, 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 you know, they have a lot more access to data, so maybe AI will progress faster there and all of that. But what I always say, I, I'm actually not too worried about that because as long as um, we have the creativity that we have here, and, and this is the thing, you know, there's a lot of opportunities around the world, but still the most creative folks from around the world are dying to come here. Um, and I think as long as we're always kind of open to that notion, and we are always able to bring that creativity and, and let it foster in this country, I think we'll always have a, a huge strategic advantage. Fantastic. With that, I want to highlight the final commonality that you all have, um, is that you are, you are remarkable men of action. And what we hope coming out of this summit is that everybody goes back home and takes action on, on critical issues of thank equality and everything. So thank you so much thank for being you, here man. with thank us. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.